as the nation joined the royal family to bid farewell to the late Duke of Edinburgh. Aside from the Queen, one figure stood out from the assembled royals and captured the public imagination. Here was a woman at the top of her game, perfectly turned out, but also quite rightly taking her place as one of the most senior members of the royal family. I think it was one of those photographs where you really saw Queen Catherine in waiting, frankly. There was certainly a lot made of the iconic images that we saw of Kate with uh, her black veil, the black mask, staring intently into the camera. That incredibly elegant Catherine Walker dress coat with the bow on the shoulder, the net in the hair, the incredibly glossy hair. She was wearing a pair of pearl and diamond earrings that actually had been permanently lent to her by the Queen. Pearls and diamonds are the traditional jewellery you wear for mourning. She has a kind of poise, almost a stillness, and so I think all the focus inevitably, without her really trying, was on her. She almost looked more regal than the rest of the royal family, and what a paradox that is, given that she wasn't born into it. It wasn't just Kate's appearance that drew attention that day. It was also the supportive role that she seemed to assume. Something I noticed when I was watching the footage from Prince Philip's funeral is how warm Kate Middleton was towards Prince Charles. She's saying, it's OK to show that we're actually a family in the same way that all the other people in the world are families. But that wasn't the only example of Kate's quiet diplomacy on the day. In the build-up to Prince Philip's funeral, one issue had threatened to overshadow the whole occasion. Prince Philip's funeral happened at a very strange time in the story of the royal family. So instead of unity, the story has become the two princes, William and Harry, feuding. She made a beeline for Harry, and the two of them are walking out of the chapel. Kate walks quite far so that they catch up with William, who is ahead of them. Kate herself seems to draw back a little to enable the princes to walk next to each other directly, as if she's saying, look, you guys, you have to put forward a united front. And of course, that was the moment that people had been hoping to see the two brothers speaking together after what we know has been a really prolonged and significant fallout. I think, look at the Duchess of Cambridge on that day and you think, she's, you know, she's pretty, she's pretty formidable. She's a huge asset. Ladies and gentlemen, the Royal Highness. Hello. Many royal watchers believe that Catherine's modest but highly effective contribution that day was the pinnacle of her developing maturity as a royal. In a portfolio of skills she has carefully nurtured over the last decade. But Kate hadn't always had it easy. In the early days, as the girlfriend of Prince William, she was labelled everything from weighty Katie to not aristocratic enough to marry into the royal family. But somehow she threw off the critics and retained her composure. And in October 2010, William proposed with a wedding date set for early the following year. I took her up somewhere nice in, uh, in Kenya and, uh, and proposed. It's very romantic. There's a true romantic in that. There is. <laughs> and you said yes, obviously. Of course, yes. Yeah. Thankfully. William and the palace seemed to feel that Kate possessed the calm and resolve to withstand the huge pressures of royal life and those of her future queen. Given that she didn't have at that stage, any real media training and certainly no experience of handling press intrusion. She was very cool, she was very calm. And I think some members of the royal family sort of noted how well she coped with that pressure. This calmness under fire, this ability to be able to preserve the mask, and that is absolutely one of her key qualities that will make her such a good queen. In April 2011, the wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton took place at Westminster Abbey, in a ceremony watched by an estimated two billion people worldwide. 
And that day became apparent that Kate could be a style icon in the making. From the moment that Catherine stepped out of that wonderful vintage Rolls Royce and the public saw her dress, she sealed her reputation as a, as a fashion icon. Kate Middleton wore a dress created by the label Alexander McQueen. It was a very beautiful, extremely pared down, sort of medieval bodice with a, a full skirt and then a gorgeous silk overlay. Very sharp, very chic. It was as if Kate was saying to the world, well, this is my style. Once Meghan arrived, there seemed to be changes in the press coverage of Kate. Now, there had never been very negative stories around Kate Middleton. They were just silly. They were talking about her hair and they were sort of saying, well, she's a bit boring. When Meghan arrived on the scene, suddenly the tenor of the stories around Kate Middleton became so positive and gracious and isn't she lovely and see how she's doing her duty. All of the heat went on to Meghan. It seemed that the press were setting up Kate in competition with the latest royal. The two women were pitted against each other in really quite a sexist way. And here was Kate, the perfect princess who could do no wrong. I think that very diametrically opposed narrative, good and bad, really took hold. Kate was used as a stick with which to beat Meghan, frankly. In November 2018, a story broke that epitomised the polarising portrayal of the two duchesses and brought into focus the increasingly favourable characterisation of Kate, the demure, dutiful queen-in-waiting. Meghan was alleged to have made Kate cry during preparations for her wedding. Yet nearly three years later, in a shocking interview watched by millions globally, Meghan would claim that, in fact, Kate had made her cry. So when you say the reverse happened, explain to us what you mean by that. A few days before the wedding, she was upset about something pertaining to, yes, the issue was correct, about flower girl dresses, and it made me cry, and it really hurt my feelings. The overall point was they resolved it. It was just a small conversation, and they got over it, and that was that. All sorts of things happen in wedding preparations because emotions are very heightened. The British media and seemingly the British public were only too happy to sympathise with the, the poor, uh, hard done by Kate. They were consciously feeding a narrative whereby Meghan is the mean foreign Godzilla who doesn't know how to behave, and Kate is the pure, delicate little girl that's easily moved to tears. In 2019, on a highly publicised tour of Pakistan, Kate's calm handling of the press further underlined to the world how she was growing into her role as a queen-in-waiting. I travelled with Kate and William on the RAF Voyager from the UK to Pakistan. William and Kate had us all forward to the front of the plane where they were to chat to us. We're so glad you're here. Thanks so much for coming to Pakistan with us. We're really grateful you're here covering all our work. Thank you so much. It was a very skillful piece of diplomacy by William and Kate because you do want the press to be on side because then they're going to write, frankly, nice things about you. And that's exactly what happened. She acquitted herself extremely well and she looked absolutely exquisite. She wore costumes or outfits which at least gave a nod to local dress and customs. She themed a beautiful coat shirt in a shade of green by Catherine Walker, who was, of course, one of Diana's favoured designers, with a trouser by a Pakistani designer. Are you the same age? Yes. It became very clear that Kate was walking in Diana's footsteps. For instance, when she went to visit orphanages. Often these young children uh, spoke about how they or their family remembered Princess Diana. 